Sustainability is extremely important in today's resource-heavy world, especially with mass production, where millions of parts are manufactured from a single design. Saving a tiny bit of material in that design process can make a massive environmental impact and save a whole lot of money, especially as metal has tripled in price since COVID. My project is to use generative design to optimize metal usage in railing brackets and eventually expanding into more industrial parts. Hi, I'm Colin Fearing. I'm a 15-year-old inventor, and I'm interested in computers, problem-solving, and sustainability. In my pitch, my first prototype was really close to what I thought the final model would look like, but I realized I was actually going to have to make a whole lot of changes. For example, how do you screw the bracket into the wall with this metal bar directly on top of it? How does this top part actually attach to the railing? In fact, most of the steps I laid out in my pitch have changed as I began my prototyping and refining process. Before I began redesigning my prototype, I decided to learn how professionals actually approach this challenge. I took the Mindfuel STEM Skills Workshop in Product Development by Anam Rizvi, an actual mechanical engineer who does 3D design and iterative product development for a living. I learned a whole lot of things I had never even considered about the prototyping process. So with this new knowledge, I returned back to my prototyping process, where I redefined my constraints and requirements from scratch. Each time I would generate something, I would think, oh, this is the final one, like this is great. And then I'd see a critical flaw or improvement that I could make, and then I'd start the process again. To make sure these brackets could actually be used in the real world, I looked at the Alberta edition of the National Building Code of Canada to determine the maximum forces the bracket is required to withstand, as well as the required distance away from the wall and other things like hand clearance. Here are a few of the things I added or changed when prototyping. I made a space for the screw to fit into the screw hole. I beveled and smoothed screw base edges. I experimented with different area fillings. I flattened the front of the round connector bracket, but that caused the back part to stick out, so I flattened that too. I added a bend to make space for fingers and flattened the bottom connector bracket blocker. I widened this top cylinder and I fixed some asymmetrical constraints. I also added screw holes. It's hard to get a sense of size or shape when you're just looking at a 3D model. So I 3D printed many of my prototypes out to test whether the screws would fit in the holes and if the connecting bracket could slip out. In doing this, I actually discovered that the railings in my house weren't built to current code. I also had to consider how the bracket would be used in the real world. When I walk down the stairs, I hold the handrail lightly, but elders, adults, and children might grip it differently. Like they might hold it in a way that causes their fingers to hit the top of the bracket. So I constrain that area, making the model bend and give space for your fingers. In my original prototype, the only force that the bracket was designed to withstand was directly downward, but people also push or pull on the rail as well, so I made sure the bracket could withstand forces in all directions. After I was happy with my prototype, I created three final versions. One designed to withstand 900 newtons of force, which was required in the building code, one to withstand 1200, and one to withstand 1500 newtons. Now, it was time to turn my 3D models into actual metal parts. My original plan was just to send them off to some random third-party company to 3D print them, and then make a low-production casting run through a Chinese manufacturer. However, thanks to the Mindfield Mentorship Program, I learned that my product development presenter NM is also part of a local company called Exergy Solutions, which happens to specialize in metal 3D printing. Exergy graciously helped me make my prototype into a reality, and it was fantastic working with them. It's always good to get others' feedback on your projects. And my mentor recommended I label my three parts with serial numbers to tell them apart, which I totally didn't think of. The parts were 3D printed on Exergy's Rennie Shaw AM250 in 316L stainless steel. Here are the three metal parts. Each part was printed twice, so there are actually six pieces in total. Much like plastic 3D printing, these metal parts have supports which need to be removed. So while wearing proper protective equipment, I cleaned up the models. Here are the final generatively designed railing brackets. Before I test the models, I want to compare my parts to the original bracket they were based upon. Because they're made of different materials, I'll be comparing the volumes instead. So here are the volumes of each. And here are the model's percentage of volume compared to the original. This first model uses close to half as much material as the original, meaning you could almost make two parts for the price of one. In my pitch, I showed that just a 5% reduction in metal would be extremely valuable to the environment, because it also reduces mining, transportation, and manufacturing pollution. But this first model is almost a 50% reduction. And again, because metal prices are so high, this is huge for both cheaper products and sustainability. 
but this reduction in material doesn't mean much unless it can withstand the 900 newtons of weight as required by the building code. So I rigged up a contraption to test it. I started by attaching a 2x4 to this post, similar to the studs railing brackets are usually attached to in your home walls. Then, I used this piece of wood and rope to represent the actual railing. I attached my first bracket, which was the one with 53% of the material, to the railing and screwed the bracket into the stud. Then, I attached a hanging scale to the rope and a wooden platform to the bottom of the scale. I then collected all the weights and heavy things I could find and began placing them on the platform. And the bracket held flawlessly, with no bending or cracking. I would have kept testing it, but I ran out of weights and space to put them. This bracket is 53% the material of the original railing holder, while remaining just as strong. The brackets are sturdy, far more sustainable, built to code, and are now permanently installed on a railing I use every day. I learned a whole lot during this project. I learned how ultra-important version control is. When I made my pitch, I didn't label my models or organize my save files very well. But with so many prototypes in the iterative design process, I learned how much time can be saved by organizing. I also learned how important it is to get other people's viewpoints on your ideas, and to look at your project from the customer's perspective. I also learned that the prototyping process can take a whole lot longer than I originally expected. I only showed a fraction of all the changes I made. I made many, many iterations. But that's how I improved my prototype, and got it ready for the next steps. I plan to get my model lost wax casted and produced in higher volumes, likely through a Chinese manufacturer. I hope to learn more about mass production, and ways I can get my model into the hands of more people. Finally, I plan to learn more about generative design. It was fantastic to experiment with, and I only scratched the surface of what it could bring. There's one thing I know for sure, generative design will make a massive impact on our world, our design process, and the future of sustainability.